Now, now that brings me to, I think, an uh, interesting turn in this conversation, which is we're going to be joined now by my co-founder at Seoul and uh, Seoul's chairman of the board, uh, Stanford University a Medical School professor, entrepreneur, uh, inventor, cancer researcher, um, uh, uh, the remarkable Gary Nolan. Um, and this is going to be fun because, I mean, look, I, as you both know, and as many people listening know, you know, uh, even 10 years ago, but certainly 20 years ago, um, it was unthinkable that we would have uh, scientists of your caliber, um, not just discussing UAP in public, but actually um, doing uh, uh, scientific research according to norms and with proper funding um, into the phenomena. And you both do that. And um, you both are remarkably imaginative scientists, extremely rigorous scientists. So we want to give the audience an opportunity to hear the two of you in dialogue um, uh, about this research and for you, Gary, to, to ask some more questions of Beatrice about the data, yeah. how she gathered it, how she analyzed it. Well, first, I want to ping off of something that you just said a moment ago about uh, doing science properly. And so first, I want to congratulate Beatrice on this remarkable series of papers uh, that she's done. And, and frankly, the, I think, very careful way that you presented it by trying to stay away from uh, hyperbolic claims. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, there's an association with UAP. Of course, you're mm -hmm. going to be quoted as saying uh, in the newspapers that, you, these were UAP, but I, I note in the language that you used, you were incredibly uh, diplomatic and careful uh, about it. But I want to also point out something that's been happening now for like the last two or three years, whether it was the paper I published on the Council Bluffs material with Jacques and Larry yeah. Lemke, or whether it was Kevin Newth's papers, or whether it was papers, in fact, frankly, from Robert Powell and, and others, and now you and Avi Loeb, uh, that those papers are not being criticized by the usual chorus of critics. And I think that's, first of all, for two reasons, because scientifically, such as with your work, it was done correctly, you make careful uh, note of all the methodologies that were used, come up with alternative explanations, self-critique yourself, uh, go to peer review, et cetera. And so it, in, in essence, in almost what it does in a good way is make the paper boring. Uh, and so bo not in a negative sense, but so boring that they can't be critiqued because the hyperbolic claims don't become a magnet for the trolls. And what it does is it places it squarely in the realm of being able to be looked at by other scientists. And what I hope that we're doing with the Soul Foundation is creating an area within which people can have a mature conversation. And so what I'd like to know first is from the, let's say, I'm, I'm sure there's critics out there already in the astrophysics field who are uh, already ringing the bell. Um, mm. Besides those who are doing that, is there so far any positive feedback that you're getting about where people are at least saying, hey, this is interesting? Tell me. I more. have received, yes, this is interesting from some people, some astronomers, that they're like, they're getting curious about it. And I think that already makes me like happy because i don't think you can I, I i think people need to see that this work uh stands the test of time before mm -hmm. they um yeah, before they accept it so and i think people are going to want to redo things so i hope we can make our samples public soon when the papers are uh, published so that everyone can go into it and i'm almost even imagining imagine if you would have a website where you kind of jokingly put the title look for your flying saucers yourself and they can do right. all these tests with the raw data they can look at the images they can look at like do diagnostics because just looking at the images with your eyes is going to fool you 
because the eyes cannot uh, very often you need diagnostics to tell the difference between a star and a round plate defect or something like that. But imagine a page that does all these diagnostics for you and then it goes in, it does the alignments test, it does the Umbra test, and then like a, a little bit like a game, you can either arrive at the flying saucers or not. So I, I'm a little bit playing with that idea. It would be kind, kind of a fun thing to do. So that kind and, of leads to a, yeah. a question of, I mean, this data presumably is already available. I mean, you got a hold of it. W where is it kept or behind what uh, permissions uh, are it is it kept that you had to overcome to be able to do the analysis that you so did? Everyone have uh, access to the images. You can get the raw images from the SDSCI survey, and there's a lot of images there that you can get. But then, uh, if you want to get, uh, let's say, the Sp if you want to have a list of transients, the Spanish Virtual Observatory has already posted some of the. Uh, transient catalogs. The latest that is a little bit cleaner than the others, uh, we still haven't published and we have to do it together with the papers. And um, so you have, of course, these raw images. And from these raw images, you have to create a list of transients. And there are different ways of doing this, but you're going to have to uh, compare images of different epochs. And of course, it's not enough to only compare two images because then you're going to get after every asteroid, especially if you have 50 years of difference. You're also going to have different um, plate depths. So there's a lot of analysis going into selecting these transients. It's not as like too easy because you also need to look at every dot and try to make diagnostics. Is this a star or is it a round thing or what is uh -huh. that? And then Ricky Solano has produced a beautiful catalog then where he has been cleaning up this data and done a lot of work with that. So a lot of the data so then, from what I'm understanding, is collected but still offline, waiting to be processed from raw data into usable data. Some is online. Some of these, right. uh, these steps there, you can find them because they have been published right. with the MNRAS right. uh, and are at the Spanish Virtual Observatory webpage. Uh -huh. Got it. And, um, but the, in the latest preprints, we have a slightly cleaner sample and that one we still need to make available. And I hope we can do it with the, once the preprints are published. So define clean in a way that hopefully convinces people that it doesn't sound like doctored. And what, is, what does doctored mean? Uh, fixed, English hoaxed, word. played um, with. So you, you, if you have a star, let's say you, uh, it's going to have a um, PSF shape, a point spread function. And you usually want to match your object to, to this point spread function. And you also have photographic plates that are slightly different than CCDs. So their response and the way how they build uh, the luminosity, the objects, is not the same as on CCDs. So what you need to do is to uh, uh, basically make sure that your the objects, the points you have, are matching this PSF, that it has this uh, point, spread, point spread function. Mm -hmm. And that's how you select your stars. You have you have the morphology, you have these PSFs, and you need to just get rid of rid of all the crap. That so you have could you define things. for maybe you already did what yeah. a point spread function basically? Um, is. So it's basically it's basically a Gaussian. You just look there. Right. And, so uh, a dark spot in the middle with a fuzziness going out to the edge. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what you do. You match against this Gaussian, and that's. Mm -hmm.